I've just got a couple of points really about the history of Rumford Pride, which is obviously what I've been asked to speak about today. Um, and I kind of wanted to talk about how that mammoth event uh, came into existence, really. Um, and as has been said, I'll be more than happy to answer any questions at the end. Um, it was in 2015, um, I had the opportunity to take over the last remaining LGBT club night in Romford. Um, and that was really um, at the same time, I remember that same sex marriage was legalized uh, in the United States. So the kind of general consensus around LGBT rights we're really taking a step forward. Um, however, in Rumford, uh, the number of people attending those late night events was dwindling massively compared to years gone by. And nobody could really work out why. So it became a case of me trying to identify what the community needed. Um, I am fortunate enough to know loads of incredible drag queens, DJs and performers who serve as a good enough reason for people to turn up to these events because, you know, it's always a mammoth task in itself convincing people to go out until the early hours. Um, but I felt a sort of responsibility to provide some sort of educational stance to that thing. Um, so I very quickly introduced certain services to, to the events that I was running, um, such as working with Positive East, who um, I believe is in this meeting and they spoke on the lunch and learn yesterday. Uh, and that was really good because they were able to provide on the spot HIV testing for the community in a different format in the nighttime, which was really kind of it became a normal thing to do. Um, and of course, we worked with Stop Hate UK to try and encourage local people to report hate crime because hate crime, it did happen in Romford, but it didn't really get reported. It was happening, it was definitely happening. Um, but as I said, yeah, people just weren't reporting it. So we were trying to constantly work out why. And I think to this day, we're still trying to work out how to improve that. Um, so essentially my first memory of Romford's LGBT plus scene, as it were, was really in the nighttime where I felt the community um, came together. Uh, I, I'll always remember that. Um, in 2016, uh, there was great news uh, when same-sex marriage uh, was legalised in the United Kingdom. But again, there's a common theme here uh, in Romford, progress still felt very slow, or at least it did to me um, and to the people that I was in my kind of circle, as it were. Um, I remember being at a very popular nightclub in Romford on a Saturday night. You wouldn't think of it these days, would you? And uh, I think I popped into the smoking area and uh, I saw a man of my age who I know really well from the club lights and uh, I sort of bounded right over to him in the middle of the smoking area. And um, I think at the time I'd been wearing this pink linen shirt as you do and a pair of short shorts, which I'm uh, known for wearing in all weathers. Um, and, you know, it was really lovely to see, see him and he obviously said that he was so happy to see me. And he said some words to me really stuck in my mind after all these years it's still there right at the, the kind of the forefront and his words became kind of the driving force into all of the work that I did for the LGBT community and I'll never forget he looked at me on the Saturday night and he said it's so strange to see you out tonight because you don't normally see anybody from Tuesdays Tuesday nights out on any other night of the week Oh, and it was funny because um, he was right. And I remember, I mean, he was largely right. There was exceptions, of course, but, you know, I remember going to the toilets in that nightclub uh, on that Saturday night. And um, if there was a group of lads, you'd be thinking, oh my God, please don't call me a gay boy or something because yes, I am gay. So I can't really deny it. I'm wearing a pink linen shirt, for God's sake. Um, but on the same token, you don't need to have a good laugh about it. But on Tuesday nights, you kind of knew that didn't really happen and if it did happen which it did sometimes you knew that the venue staff would be sorting it straight away so i started to wonder stood there in that smoking area years ago what would give lgbt people more exposure in this area so that we could showcase our concerns and worries and that's of course when i thought uh run for pride 
and then of course the first ever romp for pride took place on saturday the 28th of july 2018 and if i were to go into the full detail about how much effort went into producing that event i mean i'd still be talking next february uh, and you'd all be sleeping probably um, what i do remember uh, as is true for all of the pride events that we organized is that um, i didn't sleep for three days before and i think that's quite a talent actually it was really by chance because um i remember it was uh january 2018 and i just so happened to be cleaning through my junk folder, which I do every few 10 years or something. And I saw an email from Belinda who uh, worked in licensing at Haverin uh, Met Police at the time, uh, and the incredible Janie staff uh, from Haverin Council, who's hopefully somewhere in this uh, Zoom call. Um, and they invited me uh, into the council to meet and discuss hate crime. Uh, and we arranged to meet in the March a few months later. And I remember we went through this whole meeting brainstorming ideas of how we could encourage more people to report hate crime as soon as it happened and it was literally just at the end just as we was wrapping up I turned to them and I said uh, I've got an idea I've been thinking about it and uh, I want to create Run for Pride and it was really Jane and Belinda who convinced me to throw caution to the wind and produce the event which we managed to turn around somehow in four months um, so I can really blame them for those uh, horrific sleepless nights. Some people, they ask me, why did it take so long for Romp for Pride to happen? And it's a really strange story because even though I thought of it, thought of it uh, a year or so before then in that smoking area, it wasn't until 2017, just after Alan Turing Law, when I decided it had to be done. Um, I was stood in South Street, Romford on a Tuesday and it was during the day. Uh, and I'd got to the club early because um, I was busy getting ready, putting up decorations or something. Um, and I just got out to get an iced coffee, which you normally do as a gay man. Uh, I wish I had one now. Um, and just as I was walking back to the club, probably in my short shorts, he, uh, this, this grown man was there. Um, and I remember it so clearly. And he, he looked at me and in front of all of the midday shoppers, he said, look, everybody, look at that effing gay boy over there. And people laughed, quite a few people laughed actually. It was humiliating. Um, but what shocked me more than the comment itself was how much it had affected me. Somewhere inside there was a voice that was saying, you know, being quite thick skinned as it were, or at least I like to think so. If I have struggled so much to cope with that comment, given the fact that I run an LGBT event in the night time and I know all of this amazing stuff about LGBT rights and such. How would other LGBT people living nearby have been able to cope? I know people in the community nearby who would never leave the house again if they had experienced that sort of, you know, something as silly as, you know, petty name calling. Uh, horrific. So I decided then and there to, pro to produce this pride festival that gives the community representation and a platform to rather dramatically say uh, we are here in Rumford so don't mock us you know we are here we're not different we're not crazy uh, and I'm pleased to say uh, very pleased to say that every last Saturday of July the uh, LGBT plus rainbow flag is paraded right over the spot where that hate crime took place uh, all those years earlier. And that always brings me great joy. Uh, it's funny speaking about hate crime because I do times that in the LGBT plus community, we normalize name calling hate crimes as something we should just expect. Like it's a rite of passage, everybody goes through that, it's nothing new. But stood there on that day uh, with my iced coffee, I didn't agree with that. I thought we don't really deserve to have this, not, 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 not here, not in Rumford. And that is why it's place in South Street rather than some far away field or in the market. Because I always felt that we needed to put Rumford in the Rumford Pride right in the middle of the street, very visible to everybody and where it could not easily be avoided. I mean, we closed the bus route for the day. It definitely can't be avoided. And hopefully that exposure has helped to show that Rumford's LGBT plus community does very much exist, even if you don't see us in a smoking area on a Saturday night. 
Um, between the first and second run for Pride, my Tuesday club night moved to Yates Bar on the corner of South Street and it rebranded as Lollipop Nights. And as in the years before, every Tuesday night, we would all meet on the dance floor, dressed up how we wanted and celebrated uh, being who we are. And I think if I had the time and if we had about six hours, I would go into the long list of people whose lives have been changed event um, and it's funny in this lockdown which for whatever reason feels like the most difficult one the messages from people that I'm receiving who are holding their memories of lollipop nights as something to look forward to when we come out of this I mean it shocks me it really does shock me and it's crazy the kind of effect it's had on people uh, that it's giving people hope in this craziness that we're living through the success of those Tuesday nights meant that we were eventually given every last Friday of the month uh, to produce the event uh, as well. And I have to say there's nothing more iconic than uh, 500 people, either LGBT or their allies, coming together on a Friday night in the middle of Rumford, dancing to Kylie Minogue or Pet Shop Boys or something like that. Uh, the existence of Lollipop Nights means that we have a consistent all year round fundraiser for Rumford Pride. Um, and I have very big plans for Lollipop Nights in the future when one day the world gets back to some normality. But Run for Pride is of course still brand new. Uh, we managed to produce two festivals, it feels like a hundred. Uh, we produced two festivals before the pandemic. Planning for the event begins in September, October, the previous year, where I meet with Jane from the council um, and the Met Police. Uh, and we talk through initial plans. And then we engage with, um, hundreds of local businesses and charities working out how people can get involved from day one and i say this like a broken record i wanted to connect local residents with businesses and charities who on any ordinary day those local people would struggle to easily reach you know there's one thing being on a you know a phone trying to get through to one of these services versus falling out of your doorstep and then going to south street and being able to engage with them there and then. Uh, finally, in 2020, even though we could obviously not produce the uh, full event, we did manage to create a virtual run for Pride, which was streamed to Facebook and YouTube in June. Uh, the theme for this event was hope, and it was really amazing, really amazing seeing the community's hopes for the future, for their lives, and for the community as a whole. Um, and it was kind of important in a way to give people something to look forward to in that difficult time and of talking of hope we are really hoping to be able to bring the full run for pride back to south street at some point later this year if it's on christmas day it's on christmas day and, uh, and of course uh, i hope to see you all there in your rainbow t-shirts um i'd just like to finish by saying uh what i always say rather dramatically uh, before we hand over to questions, if there are any. Um, Run for Pride does not belong to me. Um, I just wish that I could say the same about its finances. Uh, and in fact, all I've done is really manage somehow, I don't know how, to provide a platform for the people who do the hard work and the people who have done the campaigning and the people that have come before me. And from the first day that I started running that club night back in 2015, I've always believed that it should be the community who are focused on and put first, because it is those incredible people in the community who have been able to make pride in Romford. Thank you.